Well, welcome everyone to a special edition of the Missoula County Commissioner's Tip of the Spear podcast. So today we are doing something special. We're going to uh, be doing a number of things related to wild game. We're going to talk about what it means to have food policy here in Missoula County. And we are actually in a Missoula County facility as we speak. We're in the Missoula Public Library, the brand new library that Missoula County residents have invested in the past couple of years. And we are in the demonstration kitchen of this library up on the third floor. This is a beautiful facility. It's in use doing demonstration cooking projects for the public. And it's a way of us uh, really capitalizing on what this library means. It means education, it means knowledge. For us as county commissioners, it also means a way to reach out to the public, and it means for us a way to talk about policy. And food policy is a huge part of what we're concerned about as Missoula County commissioners, and we wanna share a little bit of that with you today. So I'm gonna kick things off talking a little bit about what is right in front of you here and what's in front of me, some wild game and we'll come back a little later in the afternoon after this thing cooks all day and bring in a few additional guests, my colleagues uh, on the Board of County Commissioners and some other special guests. But to get right to it, what do we have here? Well, let me show you. We have venison shanks. And what are these babies? So this is basically the foreleg of, or, or the lower hind leg of a deer. I've got both mule deer and white tail deer here today. For me, hunting is a tradition that goes back in my family, well, as, as early as I can remember. And for me, it's a way in the current uh, era in which we live in my family to get meat on the table, meat that is hormone free, that's healthy. Uh, it's an opportunity to engage with the wild and nature and the landscape here in Montana to harvest wild game, to be respectful to these animals by way of processing it on my own, and also to figure out how to cook these doggone things. So, shanks. I don't know if, if you're like me, if you're a hunter, you might have struggled with this question also. What do you do with these doggone things? So they are full of this silver skin and tissue and sinew. For years growing up, I and my family, for want of a, a better strategy, would sometimes meticulously try to uh, peel off the silver skin and then, then use the meat either for for a burger or sausage, uh, and, and rarely was it uh, very fun or, uh, or productive in doing that, and, and it caused any, uh, any number of excruciating hour of frustration. So in some cases, I have no doubt that folks think this is just an uh, unpalatable and unusable piece of meat, and, and they might just toss it, which is tragic because these things that you are laying your eyes on right now are diamonds in the rough. I've come to discover these are some of the absolute best cuts of meat on the animal. Uh, but you got to know how to prepare it right. And, uh, and I would uh, recommend against either taking the time to skin out each little piece of meat on these things, or alternatively to toss it out, which is never a good idea, or alternatively just throwing it into your mix of burger. When it comes to burger, my philosophy is don't put it in the, the, the batch of burger meat unless it's something you would otherwise just want to eat. Uh, so this means not putting in just all the, the garbage scraps. It means uh, good red meat into your burger. And I have an alternate way of addressing shanks and that's why I'm here today. So what we're going to be co cooking today is a recipe that I found in Buck Buck Moose by Hank Shaw. A great recipe, Tunisian braised shanks, braised venison shanks. So in preparation for today, I took out of the freezer some of our shanks from last year's season. I've got uh, about four shanks here, and it's going to take a few hours to cook these things, but in advance of that, and to save a little time today, 
I already prepared the uh, essentially the marinade that will go on top of the shanks and cook with it all day. Uh, basically what I did was took a Dutch oven and uh, had a uh, uh, quarter cup of butter, sauteed onions for about 10 minutes, threw in some garlic uh, for a couple more minutes on top of that, and then threw in some spices. And what we're talking about here is a mixture of cumin, ground cayenne red pepper, ground turmeric, ground ginger, uh, some cinnamon, and also uh, a pinch of saffron. And mix that together, simmered it, and we will just add this to the mix right here. Ironically, it's by virtue of the fact I, that, that there is all this sinew that melts down in the course of the next few hours that makes this such a, uh, a wondrous piece of meat that folks just are not typically aware of. So we'll cook this for about three hours. Uh, I'll pull it out of the oven. If it looks good to go, we'll then add uh, some chickpeas, add some chopped dates, and uh, we'll garnish all of this with uh, just a little bit of um, Italian parsley. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'll pop this in the oven and we'll be back in a few hours and reconvene. Welcome <laughs> back to Tip of the Spear, everyone, and greetings from Missoula Public Library. I'm Commissioner Juanita Vero and Commissioner Josh Slotnick. Commissioner Dave Strohmeyer, Civil Attorney Anna Conley, and food critic Ari Laveau. Well, we have um, a special plan for you guys here. We're going to, Strohmeyer has uh, venison braised Tunisian uh, shanks. Uh, Slotnick here has a special salad, or actually is it Anna's salad, Slotnick's it, ingredients? It's a joint we're, we're teaming up. Yeah. Okay. Anna okay. and I teamed up in the salad, and I'm doing uh, some greens. Well, let's start with the salad. Why don't you guys um, show us what you're gonna do here? All right, let's do it. Okay, well, we have some spinach, and the spinach is from Clark Fork Organics Farm, and the farmers there are absolutely the nicest people, <laughs> and they know what they're doing, and they actually provide a lot of food to our community, so it's really exciting to have this very fresh, I think it was picked today. Picked today. Is that right, Josh? Picked today. So we're gonna use some spinach, and then we're gonna use some feta, and this feta is also from a very special source. Yeah, from our friends at Lifeline Dairy in the Bitterroot. Yep, so, so far we're all local. And then we're gonna use some um, salad dressing, and I make this recipe a lot just for like a weeknight salad. And it's olive oil and balsamic vinegar, and then it's lemon, honey, and, um, salt and garlic and a little pepper and I just shake it up and it has a little bit of sweetness a little bit of tartness and it kind of goes with whatever salad mm. you're working on and then I also brought some roasted pumpkin seeds because I like to put them in salad for a little crunch and a little texture so the first question is how big do you want these should we rip them or should we put them in whole Ari what's your perspective yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you could you could even rip you could not rip Okay, but I'm so just glad whatever. you're putting salt in there because one pet peeve I have about salad dressings is nobody puts salt in it. Like, what's missing from oil and vinegar? Salt. Yes! So as Ari mentioned, this spinach overwintered. So we planted this spinach actually last year in August. Picked it a couple times and then let it go, uh, hanging out over the winter and it got yeah. covered up with snow, which works really well. Wow. If we have a cold winter and not much snow, spinach doesn't tend to make it, but this year we had plenty of snow. When the snow melted, we put some row cover, some reme over it, so it wouldn't get too damaged if it frosted hard. But spinach is tough stuff. I mean, it can frost and the spinach is fine. And you can really taste the difference between fall spinach and spring spinach. My friend Juan here will, it, can you, can you, can it, like is, feel it your, feels. You can feel your shirt. You can feel out. like Popeye right now. It's, no, it, it it's, has so much more depth does. and density. It's, it's well muscular, said. as you it call is, it. It is. It's way muscular this spinach. Is a, this is as muscular as it gets. Spring spinach is just like all water, and this is all fiber. It's it's strong stuff. And iron. Charlie. And iron. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, I I'd, I'd, I'd probably just put it all in. All it. All right. Let's do it. Plates it. 
uh, if we had no snow and cold, the spinach might not make it. And some of them have yellow on the leaves. That's all right, because when spring really kicks in, it's already kicked in, but when it starts to be much warmer at night, the spin this spinach will start growing and new leaves will come out where the, and the old yellow ones will die off. Hmm. And then pretty quick after that, this, this spinach will bolt, which means it goes to seed. And you'll be able to tell that's gonna happen because the, the leaves go from being kind of roundish shaped to being arrow shaped. Mm -hmm. And as it starts to bolt, which means going to seed, it gets kind of chalky and doesn't taste very good. So it's not like we're gonna be able to harvest the spinach till July. We have a little bit of window in spring and early summer where it's super good and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. But we'll be planting new baby spinach outside gosh, within probably two weeks. So you see baby spinach celebrated advertised. Like, yeah. Is it just easier to work with? You don't have to tear it. Or why is it? Why is baby spinach a thing? Yeah, that's it's a total, scam. It's a total scam. Yeah, yeah. That's an exactly. question. This is, this is as good as it gets right now. And until you see the cottonwood start to fly, you know, as, as solstice hits, then that's when it starts to bolt. Mm -hmm. But right now, between now and then, I just think it's as good as it gets. Especially if you can get the overwintered stuff, I would always pick the kind of beefier, meatier, more muscular, overwintered stuff over the baby spinach. Yeah, right? this yeah. is great. It's, I, it, the baby spinach right now that you get at the store, taste, compared to this, tastes like nothing. Literally tastes yep. like nothing. Well, it doesn't yep. have any life experience. All it's yep. done is exactly. sprout, yeah. and then they chop it off and they cart it to, to market. You know, this, yeah. this spinach has had some serious experiences. Yeah. So I, part I, of the importance of having a culinary or a kitchen at the public library is to increase our culinary literacy and I have just learned something. Um, so thank you so much. Yeah. It's like a French thing, terra something. You are. That's this. Yeah. I mean, you're getting Missoula snow, Missoula soil, our air, our sun right there repackaged in the form of spinach. And the weather itself. I mean, I think plants can assume a more alpine form. You all know we have a, a food policy board at Missoula County. It's quite a thing to take an idea and turn it into a reality in a bureaucratic environment where that's not really supposed to happen. It was a great idea. It's such a neat concept to take all these different stakeholders with regard to food because there's the climate issues and there's sustainable farming issues and there's zoning issues and there's hmm. health and there's food equity. Oh, yeah. And instead of having all these people siloed and not communicating with each other, you can have them come together, work together to come up with recommendations and give something to policymakers that has a touch of a bunch of different experts. Oh, so well said. Perfect. So we did it. Yes, yeah. congratulations. And all those, and the, all those sort of genres of work and thought that you just described are represented on our city county food policy board. So what sort of policies do they work on? Well, so they're just coming into their second year and spent the, they spent their first year really kind of getting up to speed. So they picked an issue for e each month and then brought in a speaker who could speak to that issue. Everything from zoning to food access to food at schools to processing meat or dairy jobs, all of those sorts of things, and really kind of got up to speed. Then the beginning of the second year, they created a work plan for 2022, and then subcommittees working on specific issues. So there's some folks working on food access, some people working on economic development, and then another group of folks who are working on issues around the quality of food school children get. And so the three of us and the city council will be getting some policy recommendations from all three of those subcommittees at some point in the next year. Can you go back to food access? Because um, yeah. that, that is a couple words that are always thrown out there, but what Good does question. it really mean in yeah. Missoula or Missoula County? Yeah. Well, one of the issues these folks are talking about around food access is where are grocery stores that sell things like fresh fruit and vegetables and where do people live? And there are some spots in our county that are kind of far away from such a store where unless people are really gonna make a trek, they end up buying food at the gas station. And food access means that everybody has regular, easy, predictable, safe access to high quality food. And high quality food doesn't necessarily mean the salad that Anna just made. It means something like that though. So fresh food, 
fruits and vegetables, things that are good for you. Typically not the stuff sold at gas stations that I get that gas stations are very necessary to our world. It's not where you should be buying your groceries. Not every neighborhood in our county has a grocery store in it. So there's a subcommittee, the Food Policy Board right now that is wrestling with trying to figure out how to get grocery stores or in cities they would call them like a little bodega, a small market, into some corners of our county where there aren't any. Or in corners of gas stations that are already established or that's what, that's what that's is, an idea what are for, some of the things that they're so, running into or the well it's just begun but mm -hmm. one of the ideas is to work with gas stations that are right that are there right now but you know uh, real estate within a retail situation is precious so i don't mean selling the gas station i mean literally every spot within a gas station where there's a rack and something is sold sunflowers and twizzers and chickens. there's a there's a uh, an economic opportunity cost if you take away the beef jerky and put in bags of spinach Jerky's going to sell way better than the spinach, right? So if, if we were to hope that gas stations are going to start selling fruits and vegetables in neighborhoods where there are no grocery stores, we need to create some kind of incentive. And, and so then I feel bad when I go now. to a gas station that is actually selling fruit. I actually never buy it. I'm and, sure. Um, but, and, I, and I wonder, like, yeah, should I be buying that banana or that apple in that? I don't know, and, and it doesn't. Stand. And this is the sort of thing that doesn't have to happen everywhere. So I'm not saying this needs to be universalized and every gas station needs to. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in areas where there is no grocery store nearby. Yep. We should set it up so anybody can run to the store quickly and get something fresh and good to eat. And those things shouldn't cost so much. This food costs a lot of money, unfortunately. I mean, it didn't cost us anything because the spinach came from my farm. But if you were to go buy fresh spinach right now, I'm sure it's six, seven bucks a pound. I'm just guessing. It's expensive. Yeah, well, and that, that raises a really important question of how do you get the food to the gas stations in a timely enough manner, <clears throat> you know, that it stays fresh. And then if it goes bad at the gas station, who is holding the bag for, yeah. for a rotten yeah. You know, These are all, all issues that absolutely need to be wrestled with. And if I owned a gas station in some far corner of our county where there was no grocery store, I would not want to get into the fresh fruit and vegetable business. Yeah. When the jerky sells great and it's got a shelf life of like 6.9 years or something, right? So it's, it's a tough nut to, to crack, but there are now a group of people attempting to do just that. And this is by no way shaming of gas stations. We're just looking at... <laughs> stores that already <laughs> exist and it, it, it's cheaper to work with existing infrastructure than to create new but this is one of the things they're wrestling with and it's a great question food access is, as a pair of words is thrown out all the time and what do we really mean by that so josh yeah. this sounds like super exciting work that's currently getting off the ground with the uh, the advisory board yes uh, do, do you think there there's a role for county government local government to play in all of this Abs absolutely so the the mission of the Food Policy Board is to bring policy recommendations to the electeds, whether that's the three of us or to the city council and to the mayor. So I'm fully expecting that they're gonna bring us something. Don't know exactly what that's gonna be, and they're really being diligent about being careful about what they say, rather than, you all need to do blah blah, blah. They're not gonna say that unless they've researched it and figured out what a path to blah blah actually is. And I really appreciate that they're taking this super seriously. So we'll get some type of recommendations. They also spent a bunch of time looking at our zoning, specifically around Grass Valley, where there's a lot of active farmland. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, there's, there's obviously a land use element to all Absolutely. of this. Absolutely. When we talk about agriculture and farming, and just wasn't sure to what extent they were looking at any of those issues. Well, they, they, they took a hard look at our zoning and uh, weighed in specifically around the, the zoning out in Grass Valley, where it's zoned at pretty light density, but there are density bonuses if a landowner chooses to cluster their housing. So it's zoned one per 40, but you could have two, three, or even four houses. You just gotta put them right next to each other because preserving 37 acres is functionally pretty similar to preserving 40. And we really recognize the need for housing, but all housing doesn't need to be in all places. So there's some spots where density makes lots of sense and other places where it doesn't. During the summertime at the farmer's market, you know, just this amazing local produce. And then I wonder economically how those people survive through the winter. And I know there's a winter market, but mm -hmm. I wonder if there's more access to local good food, if that would be a benefit to the economy for those folks who are yeah. trying to make it through. The yeah, non that's a, it's a good question. I wish... I wish I had a good answer in terms of generalities, but I'm thinking of farms that I know of that sell at one or the other of each, one of, one of either of our two big downtown farmer's markets. And the larger farms 
all have multiple outlets for sales. So they do quite a bit of wholesaling <coughs> and some direct sales from their farm and then selling at farmer's market. On a Saturday, it might look like, well, Ari's farm is at the market. That's what he does. It's probably just a sliver of what he does. You can buy Ernie's cheese, Lifeline cheese, right? You can buy Ernie's cheese at the Clark Fork market on a Saturday, but I'm, I'm, I don't want to even venture a guess. It's just a small percentage gotcha. of their business. Most of what they do is wholesale, but that's not to say that it isn't important. It is important economically to those farmers, and it's really important to Missoula. Think about how many people are spending money on a typical Saturday morning. It's, it's fantastic. It's great economic generation. Yeah. But so you're asking a really good question, and, and I wish I could make more general, generalizations, but it would really mean speaking to each one of those farmers and finding out where are their income streams and what do they do in the winter. So it's all different, all it's different all models. all different. There are people who sell at market where they have you know, an acre, and all they do is go to farmer's market, and it's a fun thing, and it adds, it's an income stream for their family, but they may also have two other kind of mainstream day jobs. All right, so it's been uh, about three hours here where I think we're probably getting close but for the the, the home stretch with the the uh, venison shanks I'm gonna dump some chickpeas in there some chopped dates and we're gonna put it back in for uh, a little while and uh, hopefully by the time the rest of the meal is done this will be ready to go so any luck oh these are looking good these are starting to look good here that oh, it smells so right, good. What do you think looking at that? I, I, I want a pan like that, for <laughs> one, first and foremost. And, so, uh, yeah. yeah, this is your uh, common turkey roaster here. I found that this is about the only thing that will fit the shanks. So we're going to just ladle in some chickpeas here. So, Dave, are those chickpeas cooked already? They are not. So those are, those, are the, did those come out of a can? They did, did they them? did. I'm just gonna put these dates in here too. Dates too, yum. Uh, I had no idea what to do with these doggone shanks. Uh, you spend hours trying to uh, skin this, get the silver skin so, off of these things. So for, and, for the uninitiated, what, what part of a deer is a shank? Shanks are basically the the uh, the lower legs. Uh, like the knee front. down? Yeah, so we're gonna put in about a tablespoon of uh, honey out of the honey bear here. Dates and chickpeas and honey, it's already good. Yeah, the magic of braising, the low and slow cooking technique, is that all that silver skin that you had been slaving away to try and remove so you could grind it up in the past, you just figured out that you can just melt it. Oh. And that, it's actually pro protein, mm. that cartilage, but when it melts, it has the mouthfeel of fat. So you're really getting the best of all worlds. You, it tastes and feels like fat in your mouth, but it's protein. Mm -hmm. And it's no longer in your way, and it's full of some, you know, so micronutrients. Is, so it's braising just shorthand for long and slow. Well, it technically means kind of half in, half out of, of the liquid, exactly how Dave's doing it. Okay. So it's like boiling and simmering below the water line and steaming above the water line. And steam is actually hotter than water. So it's, a, it's, cook, it's cooking really fast, you know, even when it's not submerged. The parts that are not submerged. How cooking. many hours is this going to cook for? So this has been about three mm -hmm. hours, so we'll go a little bit longer for uh, finishing up the rest of the uh, side dishes here, Great. and it should be ready here in not too long. Nice. I think it's ready now. I think we can see it ready. <laughs> <laughs> We're making couscous. And we're uh, we're just adding couscous to flavored water. We're going to add this in here. And then we're gonna roast some nuts. These are pine nuts. And like Anna was saying about roasting nuts, and, and speaking of the the, uh, the culinary uh, literacy, I never thought roasting nuts was like a thing. It's kind of like, why would you waste your time? Just it's the nut, eat the nut. Um, and I made a, a Thanksgiving uh, stuffing that I do all the time, and it calls for roasted hazelnuts, and I was like, ah. Oh, I don't want to roast the hazelnut because then you got to peel it and it's just a pain. Uh, but oh my gosh, the flavor is amazing when you take the time to roast the nuts. So yeah, the same roast goes with spices too. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, it'll bring out a lot more flavor. Uh, this is an onion that came from my family farm and has been in existence since last August. And here we are, April first, eating an onion that was grown right what here. What kind of what kind of onion? Uh, I think this is called a copra. 
Uh, if it's not a copra, it's one like that. A copra is a variety known for storage. And you can tell this is a real storage onion because right now it's firm, but if you look at it, there's no space in here. It just looks dense. Space would be where air and water are, and then it's gonna start to rot. Storage onions are just rock hard, and they have this nice thick rind on the outside that protects them, kind of like a rind on a melon. So people have, when we talk about local food, often folks wanna know, well, what the heck are we gonna do in the winter? You can't eat arugula in the winter time. True, you can eat arugula in the winter time, but you can eat carrots and beets and potatoes and onions and winter squash, as people who lived in Missoula did for probably the last hundred years. And the native folks who are here lived on winter food much, much longer than that. So you can definitely grow traditional vegetables in the summertime and eat them in the wintertime. We don't need to build warehouses and fill them with lights and solar panels on the roof so we can have vegetables in the wintertime. We can eat summer vegetables, fall vegetables in the winter by storing them properly. And a lot of things like onions don't require any refrigeration. It didn't cost any money to store this onion. Okay, so I'm gonna cut this bugger up uh, pretty thinly uh, so that the quick pickling will happen. If it, if it was, um, if uh, I cut them really, if I cut the onion very thickly, it wouldn't work as well. I wanna so, look at the spacing, I didn't understand. See wow. how dense it is? Wow, See, it's yeah. Just, and if you were to grab an onion uh, in right. the summertime, or before they cure. You guys already know this, but I've never really looked at the density. That is yeah. dense. Dense. Never been curious about that. Yeah. So I'm gonna cut these really thin. You can see it's starting to, to sprout like the plant it is. Yeah. A lot of people would freak out about that. Um, you know, like a little sprout. They, they freak out about a sprout in a garlic too, but like, it's just garlic. It's a living it's thing. It's onion. You just eat yeah. it like anything else. You don't have to like dig out. Some people will literally like dig out the green part in the middle of an onion or a garlic and throw it away. I mean, August was a long time ago if you were an onion. <laughs> and so in here you have some collard greens, is that right? Yes. And you, you harvested those in the fall yep. and froze them. Exactly, that's why they're in that Ziploc. And uh, so we harvested them in the fall and then blanched them. And blanch means drop into boiling water for just a moment. Is it just water or is there anything else? Is there any just, salt in the water? No, <laughs> just water. And then they go from that boiling water into cold water. So they stop cooking because you don't want them to be mush. And then stuffed them in a bag and put them in the freezer. So we are eating last fall's collards. And actually my family's been eating collards and kale and chard all winter long. And you know, and I get for a lot of people, if you were to say collards, kale and chard, they'd be like, gross, yuck, that's weird food. Uh, these are dark green leafy vegetables that human beings have been eating forever. Uh, it's kind of a lost art. This isn't a new thing. This is an old fashioned thing. People have been eating greens on farms for as long as people have been living on farms. And if you get serious about nutrition, nutritionists will talk about DGLVs, dark green leafy vegetables, which is this. I'm actually 96 years old. <laughs> dark green leafy vegetables will keep you healthy if you're worried about diabetes heart disease other chronic diseases that come from diet dark green leafy vegetables and they are really delicious i think a lot of people were scalded by vegetables as children when their parents poured spinach out of a can and handed it to them and it was gross and it is gross and it tasted bad and kids should not want to eat gross bad things Wait till this is cooked, which should just take a few minutes, and it is so delicious. There's nothing quite like it. So, so, so Josh, yeah. so, so these rascals you froze over the yes. winter. Any tricks to, to keeping your, your onions? Yeah, like, for sure. Winter? That's a great question. So these onions want to, have, they want to be out of direct sunlight, and they want to have airflow. So they shouldn't be in a window. They shouldn't be sitting on a counter. Put them in a mesh bag and hang them in a pantry or your garage, if you can keep your garage over 32. And it's pretty easy mm. after that. They, and and the, the key thing with storage onions is to have the right onion. Mm. So you could have a Walla Walla onion, really tasty and delicious. Ter terrible keeping quality, not a good storage onion. This is a Copra, a really good storage onion. There's lots of varieties out there of onions. So if you're growing some at home, grow ones that have good storing quality. Or when you go to the farmer's market in the fall, ask the farmers, I want some that are gonna keep for the winter and they'll know exactly what you're talking about. It won't be an unusual question for them. As Ari can attest, farmers eat the best food. So vegetable farmers. So you're talking to vegetable farmers at the market in the fall, they're gonna know exactly the right onion if you say you wanna store onions. And if you're at a grocery store purchasing onions in the fall, what kind of onions are you getting? Man, 
Well, if you are at many stores in Missoula, you're going to be getting onions from right here. Now, there's a bunch of major grocery chains that, that just get onions from wherever. But if you're buying onions in the fall that were grown around here, there's a high likelihood there'll be storage onions. But you can tell by grabbing onto them. And if they feel like really firm, you're in good shape. If they're soft, that you can eat it, buy it, eat it, cook it. But don't imagine you're going to be eating it in April if you're holding right. onto it in August. Yeah. You know, there's something cool about the fall harvested collard greens and kale. They tend to be sweeter, wouldn't you say, than the spring Absolutely. harvested ones? So that yeah. the farmers who do eat the best food, if you're out there harvesting your kale or your collards, to then blanch and freeze, you're then actually freezing the cream of the entire season. You're totally that, correct. Especially after it's already been frosted on. You're totally correct. It brings right. out the sweetness, it kind of breaks up the fiber a little bit. In fact, we don't do any freezing until we've had a, hard, a couple hard frosts so that, they, that this, the sugars come up and then the leaves get thicker too, just like what you're talking Life about earlier. Life experience. About. Yeah, the, the fresh stuff you don't want, it's got nothing. But the stuff that's hanging around in October, <clears throat> That's the bomb. So the quick pickling. I'm using just some cheap, regular old distilled vinegar. Pouring that into the onions. And when I grabbed stuff to bring here today, I forgot to bring some sugar. I just need a little bit of sugar. But thankfully, there's a coffee shop here at the library. So I got some. <laughs> this is urban foraging. <laughs> urban foraging. That's a Kim hey, Williams how much phrase. Kim, Kim so Williams, Kim, be Kim Williams thank you. How, how much, I mean. I put in like a, like a. What a, should it look like? Like a tablespoon, not much in the way of sugar. I mean, just you've covered, bit. you've covered. Yeah, they, they need to be submerged and a little bit of sugar, and then they just hang out. Onions are in the allium family. That's garlic, onions, scallions, shallots, elephant leeks. garlic, leeks. Yeah, the shallots, I think, are they're the, the pinnacle of the allium family because they have the best keeping quality. Mm -hmm. They can last for almost a year staying really good and they're sweet and delicious and just everything about shallots is it's my favorite and if you have garlic and an onion somewhere merged in between there is a shallot the trick with shallots <laughs> is finding them big enough because they're so small you gotta like peel them but if you can find a grower and there are growers around here we grow big ones okay you, you yeah. must grow them like onions right you sprout them in february you don't like plant the little bulbules right exactly exactly See? yeah and then you yeah. get big shallots yeah there there our shallots are growing in a greenhouse right now yeah you don't want to plant the little bulbules you like you plant a thing and then you get one in return is there a taste difference between them um well they're small, small ones. so you have less taste because it's smaller so we got there yeah. <laughs> so one of the things i found in thailand was a way that they cooked eggs that i really liked yeah, you can put your and I'm going to do it that way. And there's some shell in here. And I also want to say, if I'm talking about Thailand, I had one of the best meals of my life with this gentleman right here. How many years ago? That was a long time ago. Like oh, 20 man. years ago? That's, that's, that's too depressing. That's not too right. depressing. Well, the think, no, the thing about how many years it was. Years. It oh, was yeah, so no, no, good, though. The meal though. is not depressing, other than the feeling that you've already peaked, so... Yeah, the death is it was you. kind of magical. Yeah, we had to cross a river... To yeah. that place, right? Yeah, they, exactly. They, they sent a boat to bring us across the river. Exactly. Yeah. And I was, we were wandering around in Bangkok, in the middle of the city, in the dark, and I'm leading these guys around because a bunch of years ago I used to live there, saying, I know there's this restaurant by the river somewhere in here. And then literally out of the dark, this woman steps out, and she's wearing like a long gown, like a like very traditional like kimono. long kimono-ish type of thing, wrong culture, but it was like that. It just stepped out of the shadows and then said to, in Thai, are you looking for the restaurant? I'm like, and he yes. can speak Thai. I can speak like, Thai. Like, like, yes. So I said, yes, we are. And then she reached into her, her robes and pulled out a walkie-talkie. Whoa. <laughs> and spoke Thai into the walkie-talkie and pointed us to the pier on the river. And then a boat came across the river, picked us up, and brought us to this restaurant that was... Kind of un amazing, unbelievable food. And uh, Ari wanted to go back into the kitchen. We went to the kitchen, talked to the chef, remember that? And then they just kept bringing us food until we had to say, no, we can't take it anymore. I think there were like eight of us, too. It was, it was a, a notable meal. But you know what, Josh? You, <laughs> have, that, you have that sensibility. Like you, <laughs> you don't, don't sell yourself short because you are a mean Thai cook. Yeah. Mean in a good way. <laughs> so... You may know, if you live in the city of Missoula, in the urban area, it's legal for you to have hens. You can't have a rooster, but you can have hens. We did that back in city council days. Were you part of <laughs> I was part nice of job. Yes. I remember such a controversy, too. It, it was a big deal having oh, chickens wait, in Josh, the city. Oh, wait, Josh, that is secret sauce right yeah, there. Yeah, so, this is... uh, 
Thai, this is fish sauce, nam bla. We're going to sign nam bla. And a little bit goes a long way, and Josh is being very generous. Generous, generous yeah. It's going to be blended over, a, over yeah. a large landscape. So, And fish sauce is salty. And when you're cooking locally with local eggs, local onions, local collards, like something like fish sauce, that can travel across the ocean in a, like a, a freighter boat. It doesn't need to be transported, refrigerated. So, you know, that's the kind of decisions that a real, you know, black belt local eater will make, is to have the heavies, the proteins, you know, the vegetables from close to home, and bring in your condiments, you know, your spices, like they I used like to that. back You used day. to call it the Marco Polo rule. The Marco Polo yeah, rule, If it yeah. could come on a boat, go for it. Like a sailboat, yeah. unrefrigerated, yeah. you know. Then it's going to be the cheapest, you know, lowest emissions. Yeah, and this non blah, it can absolutely come in a boat. It just gets better with it. This oil came from Big Sandy, Montana. Whoa. At my buddy Bob Quinn's farm. So we're going to use some of Bob's safflower oil here. And All why right, are you using safflower? You, 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 you want to yep. talk on safflower oil? Well, one thing that's nice about safflower oil is you can cook it really hot, so you don't have to worry about burning it. That's what we're doing. And it's not going to take over the flavor. Exactly. So it just kind of stays in the background and um, you Perfect. Can it up and won't burn. So uh, maybe a lot of people may be like, I just love olive oil. Why would you not want to do olive oil for what I'm about to do with this egg? Well, you know, this is actually a little bit of a contentious issue. I'm mm. of the camp that you can fry in olive oil. So I do fry in olive oil. Uh, so, sorry to... No, so for me on this, I don't want this tasting like olive oil. This is, well, kind, of a, this is kind of an well, Asian-y that, okay, sort of thing. Okay, that's a very good point. And you, in a Thai recipe, yeah, yeah, you olive don't oil want it to taste like You olive could oil. use avocado oil, though, too, but it wouldn't be in Montana. So and and that's you a, did yep. say really clear, nicely about the safflower, is it stays in the background. This mm -hmm. isn't yep. going to really do much in the way of flavor. It's just a medium for heat. It's like vegetable oil. It's, veg it is, it's a vegetable oil. And it comes from my friend Bob Quinn's farm. So. And you can buy it in bulk at the Good Food Store and in jars. I wanted to buy it in bulk today, but they were out. So what's in the, what's going on in the oven? So there? what I'm going to do not. with this with this egg is pour it in here. That's what makes it flat. I was very yeah. confused about flat. Oh, okay, the puffiness is. Sorry, what else did you it's put like in here? Just a little bit of fish sauce. Oh, there's no dairy or anything. No, no. I keep thinking the dairy or water or whipping no. makes it puffy, but it's no. not. What's, well, what's the temperature in the, on that oven? There? I, I just wanted it on high broil. Okay. So you can you can see this starting to cook that it's it's cooked on the bottom and liquid on the top, and we're just gonna wait a minute like or so a, more. Kind of like starting an omelet. Yeah, yeah. And then we're gonna throw it under the broiler here in just a minute or two. So is this actually a Thai sort of it's thing? The, so yeah. in in Thailand, what they would do is a wok full of oil on top of a propane burner, and that gets like glowing red hot. I don't know that we have anything that store bought in Montana where you could get it that hot. Ari right, can attest to this as we bought food on the street in Bangkok. Yeah, it's like a huge burner. Just, just <laughs> it's much, like a rocket going off. Yeah, like so a, there'd be a skein of oil, eggs bubbling, and it, it's in and done. And then they put that on top of some rice, and then you get a little fish sauce with some chilies swimming in there. And oh, man, mm. Mm. super good lunch. That's about ready to put under the broiler. Looking delicious. Yeah. Wow. There we go. And that'll just take a couple minutes. And while that's happening, I'm gonna get this pot, and I'm just gonna quick chop up these collards and throw them in here. And these are just fresh out of the freezer. This is fresh out of the freezer, and man, they freeze so well that they don't they don't taste like mush. They don't they just freeze beautifully. Yeah, and so part of that is the blanching that. process that you did, which kills the enzymes. That's if you were to put that stuff in the freezer just straight up, yeah, there would still be living enzymes in the collard leaves. So there'd be sitting there chewing away at the collards. With my tomatoes, I like to either dehydrate them or do an oven sauce. I like the oven sauce. Yeah, and you can, because you can also add, you know, garlic, onions, eggplant if you got them, zucchini if you got them. But if you don't got them, it's still basically tomato sauce, but you can also incorporate those vegetables in the oven sauce. And oregano. Well, and how's that egg looking? I don't know. You're is, it puff, is it puffing up? It totally is. Look at oh, that. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's pull wow. that. Wow. We're just puffing up. I let's really pull would that. have thought dairy would have been in okay, there. You want to yeah. pull that? We're going to pull that bugger out. You got that? Um, and we're going to put it on this oh. cutting board. Okay. Got it? Put it on the cutting board. Look at this. It's yeah. so beautiful. Isn't it cool looking? Okay, so I put the collards in with a little bit of water. I'm not gonna boil them. I'm basically just gonna thaw them out, and it really it'll take like 
two or three minutes. So I'm gonna make a sauce for the greens. And Ari, I was wondering if you could just chime in. I'll mention these ingredients. Tell me what comes to mind when okay. I say these ingredients. Okay, speed so, round. Yeah, I'm gonna use a little sesame oil. Toasted, I see. Toasted sesame oil, yeah. It's not the same thing. If it's not toasted, it, does not, it won't yeah. taste like sesame. So That's what, it, what we've learned this, this session. That's toasted. right. It's Must that toast toasting. all the nuts. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think when I say sesame oil? The toasted is what comes to mind? Yeah. And uh, some tamari, okay. which is kind of like soy sauce in that right. same sort it's, of category. Uh, it's wheat free, if I'm not mistaken. It is wheat free. <laughs> well, I just like it better than soy sauce. It, it does have a, have what's like the difference a, a stronger the, the, flavor. Soy sauce has a more metallic flavor to you, or what, what, what's the I difference? Think, I think soy sauce does taste a little more chemically. Yeah. Mm. More metallic. Metallic is a really good adjective. And then rice vinegar? Of course, yeah. Any, anything come to mind? Well, I mean, we're not going to use balsamic in a Thai dish, um, but what do you mean? Hey, that's good. That yeah. Would, yeah, just that it's kind of an Asian, Asian yeah, adjacent. Yeah, we're, we're keeping in character here. Yeah. Again, these are all slow boat Marco Polo exactly. ingredients that, you know, they're all Asian Thanks. ingredients. They're very authentic Asian ingredients that don't need to be refrigerated. And it's very efficient to bring over from Asia and mix up with our, our local uh, proteins and vegetables. And I would say also, not very expensive, not fancy, not like you have to special order. This is, these are pretty regular things. So as soon as these greens melted a little bit, I'm going to strain them and pour the sauce over them, throw the onions in, cut that egg up in little slices and mix it all together. And we'll be done. Yeah, let me check. So this is guys. almost like a cooked salad. I mean, you're not, you're heating it, but you're not, you're not doing anything fancy. You're not crisping it. You know, you're, you're, you're leaving the kind of just soft leaf integrity intact. Exactly. And you're just going to drain the water and dress it. So it's a warm, leafy salad. Exactly. You know, it's and a winter you know, salad. Things like collards, overcooking them is a terrible mistake. Like they don't need much. Right. If you cook them, all the them good up. stuff goes out. Yeah, I mean, you want the, the leaves to have some oomph still in them. But you said something earlier that I liked. We're, I don't remember which bowl we were using, but you said that doesn't look very nice. And I think that's super important. You're making food out of beautiful Taurus. ingredients. It should look nice. So my wife made this bowl. This oh, is nice. beautiful. She makes beautiful bowls. Should have had a bigger bowl, but well, this way it looks like it's overflowing. Yeah, it's that's important. The illusion of bounty is crucial. Okay, I think we're. Oh, that looks lovely. I think we're there. Oh, we're not there. I forgot the onions. <laughs> so yeah. these are the quasi pickled onions. These are quasi pickled onions. You want to taste one? Ooh, yes, yes, it's a quasi pickled onion. onion. Yeah, grab grab Isn't one. There like a, yeah, do that. Aspect of these too. Gosh. Yeah. Then take them out of the water. Uh, we're done. Great. We got the salad, we got the veg side dish. I think we're ready to work. I think we're ready to go. Put the meat on the platters. Oh, should we talk about beverages? Why not? Yeah, because not? We, we need to... I see something unexpected in... in... Right, right, right. So we uh, have to... Tunisian style venison, venison shanks. Um, and so uh, I have actually never been to Tunisia, but I know that the beer that you got to drink is uh, a lager or a pilsner rather, but I know all pilsners are lagers, but not all lagers can be a pilsner. Um, and so the, the pilsner lager that, uh, that is most common there is a Celsia. Couldn't find it in Missoula. Uh, so the runner up is Heineken. And you know, like Coors, Heineken also has a unique flavor. I'm not into it. So 
We're going with a 600 year old uh, Stella, <laughs> Stella Artois. That'll yeah, work. so I think as long as it's cold, it's cold. Yeah, it's, been, it's been cold. So yeah. sorry, the brewery is 600 years old. Um, no, not then, this particular. Beer. Okay. <laughs> And then I know that we're supposed to be focused on locals, so you can untwist your knickers. We have a little beer from Bozeman. This is nice fella. This is from Mountains Walking Brewery in Bozeman. It's an Italian style Pilsner. And uh, this is actually, friends gave me this, and I'm not, I'm more of a whiskey girl, not a, not a beer person. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm it's sharing, not bad. I tried it. sharing this with you. Okay, I might yeah. have to try one. Um, but wine, do like wine, and so, with Dave's uh, shanks here, we were going with something red, and it was supposed to be generous and fruity were the, the adjectives that um, I was supposed to be looking for, but I'm not, again, that sweet thing. I'm a little not, so I can't handle too much fruity, so looking for something balanced. Couldn't find any Tunisian wine, so um, we uh, went to Lebanon, and we have, we have wow. this from from nice. the folks the good folks at um at warden so this Lebanese is a, wine. this is um this is from the becca valley in central lebanon and this is a cab Sauv tempranillo syrah blend I'm looking for a cord to so that. we'll 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 try yeah. that and then um our chief um operating officer ann hughes turned me on to cab Franx. and so that's also kind of a fruity but not too fruity balanced red so trying this one, this is a uh, Butte de Tiron from um, the Burgel, uh, in Loire Valley, Burgel, France, um, Cap Franc that is fruity, but not too fruity, um, approachable, but still generous. Oh. And then- <laughs> Like us. I hate when wine is loose. I can't stand exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. Oh, it's not approachable. Um, and then for non-alcoholic, sorry, we don't have any bubbly, but um, we also, so Tunisia, North Africa, and Middle East um, generally drink uh, a mint uh, green tea or uh, mint green, uh, mint black tea, and it's super sweet. Um, again, I can't handle the sweet, but so this is um, a variation or Tunisian in, uh, inspired tea. So it's, uh, this is from Missoula. So this is Lake Missoula Tea Company, um, Heritage Green. With That's a good one. Okay, there one. we go. Herit I As was, a green tea aficionado, that's I a good I was one. thinking gunpowder, but um, decided to go with Heritage this one. So, so we have some green tea. We have some mint leaves. Um, and I'm just going to plunge this. And if you feel like some tea, we're going to have tea with the pine nuts. So this, is, this is how we're supposed to do it in small glasses. But... <clears throat> I thought for a minute those were the same pumpkin seeds that went in his No. So, so we'll, we'll just see this. And then um, I will let you guys, and I don't have a teapot, so I'm using <laughs> my, uh, my uh, French press. But um, yeah, honey it to your liking. And I'm going to garnish it with some mint leaves, and we should enjoy ourselves. Here we go. Oh, so beautiful. Beautiful. there we go. These uh, can smell the mint. Yeah. The um, the glasses are a little on the tall side, but they'll do. Okay. Let's eat. All right. Okay. Dinner served. Let's have our <laughs> guests go. Come on. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, Tunisian. Ah, Tunisian. Thank you so much yeah. for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah.